Imagine falling down from 12 meters and breaking your back. Imagine that the doctors come to you and tell you, look, you'll never walk again. That's it, life is over. You will never be the same again. Now this could be something that's insurmountable for most of us. It would be easy to fall into the spit of despair and to lose hope. And my today's guest, Jeff Griffin, went through this predicament. You see, more than 20 years ago, he broke his back and he felt the despair. He felt like life was hopeless. But at some point he realized, wait a second, it's all about the focus and I can choose what I focus on. So he ended up building the life of his dreams. And honestly, when you look at the way he lives now, it's hard to believe that he managed to do it after having such a terrible accident. For example, 2004, he played in Athens in Paralympics. Right? So he's also playing for Utah Wheeling Jazz team. And if you are into basketball, you definitely know those guys, they're amazing. On top of that, he built two different businesses. He built a non-profit organization helping veterans and disabled people. He has a beautiful family, he has a wife and four kids, and he keeps redefining what's possible. So, you know, Jeff is a good friend. He's an amazing character. And even while doing this interview, I, I felt goosebumps. He shared with me stories that I already knew. And I still got the goosebumps because the story and, you know, his entire transformation is so powerful. So I hope that you enjoy this video. Tune in because there's so much in there. So many golden nuggets. Jack, so happy to be here with you. So happy to talk to you once again, man. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And uh, you have so much value to share with the world that I'm extremely excited to ask you a bunch of questions today. And I'm sure that my audience will appreciate all of your advice, strategies, tips, techniques. So I met you back in LA. It was what, like yeah. two, two, three months ago, which feels like two, three years. Yeah, so yeah, right, be right before this, uh, this you know, crisis going through the, uh, the country. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, today, uh, the theme I would like to talk about is maintaining mental toughness, maintaining positive attitude. I really believe that you are one of the biggest experts in the world to talk about it, considering your story, which we're going to dive into in a second. Uh, but I feel like it's important because people are really struggling, and it seems like Rather than focusing on what they can control, so many people focus on what they cannot control. And it mm -hmm. brings a lot of despair and fear. So, uh, you know, the intention is at the end of this interview, I want everybody watching to feel motivated, to feel inspired, and of course, to go ahead and get your book. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just so grateful to be here, Jimmy, because... I'm telling you right now, if I looked as half as good as you do, life <laughs> would be that much easier. Oh, come on, man. You are, you are a better dude. You are a good looking dude, but you are an even better dude inside. And that's what really counts. I think that's what, uh, that, that's what really uh, drew me to you. And, um, and so I am so privileged just to have an opportunity to be here with you. And so thank you for letting me uh, share this stage with you. My pleasure, and likewise, man. When I met you in LA, like, you know, sometimes you meet people and you feel that instantaneous bond. Yeah. And it just feels good. And, and, and you just, you can sense this real positive energy, like the goodness in a person. And that's what I saw in you. I, I never forget we were in that house and there are a few steps and you're on the wheelchair. Yeah. And as we were helping you to carry the wheelchair down, you said, no, I'm going to walk down myself. And I'm like, what a guy. What a, like, I, I'm like, this is amazing. So, I ended up talking to you probably for close to an hour there. You had lots of people around, lots of all types of amazing people, and yeah. you just kept talking. And when you shared with me your story, I felt, I, I just felt the goosebumps, man. I felt the goosebumps. It's really impactful. So before we even talk about any of the other cool stuff, strategies, you know, mental toughness, positive energy, can you please share your story, you know, from the moment where you were a football player, life was going really well for you, and uh, you know you're a very active person. To that one day that you just couldn't have predicted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, what was interesting here is what you're talking about is I was 21 years old in the prime of my life. I had been practicing, preparing, and performing for the time that, uh, you know, as you mentioned, that the, my dream was to play football in college and I was able to play two downs. I got to experience and, uh, you know, the sweetness of success and play two downs. I got to experience what it'd be like to be on the first team, to be on the field and not just be at the stadium and, and on the sidelines. 
But what was interesting here is, Jimmy, what, what your um, audience can't see right now is that I am in a wheelchair, right? And, and I speak for a living now and all over the world. And whenever I come rolling out onto the stage, I just like to just address the elephant. And I'm glad that you're like, you know what, let's just address the elephant right now. And, and of course, the elephant that I'm talking about is how good looking I am. And, <laughs> Totally joking. Totally joking on that one. I'm like, you have me beat on the market there. And, uh, but I am in a wheelchair. I am in a wheelchair and, and, and uh, that's obvious. I come rolling out. I can't hide it. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is a lot of people are, are able and capable of hiding their disadvantages, their disabilities, um, whatever you might uh, want to call them, setbacks, challenges. Um, I can't hide mine. mine. My mind is right out there. I may be physically paralyzed, Jimmy, but I believe most of us, if not all of us, are paralyzed from the demons of doubt, fear, and complacency one time or another in our lives. And if you haven't experienced those setbacks or those major challenges, um, you will. Every single one of us will find ourselves, as I did, whether it's figur figur figuratively or literally, but I found myself one day, Jimmy, being 6'1", in the best shape of my life, to 4'7", and being paralyzed and confined to a wheelchair and given a 0% chance of ever walking, standing, or moving again. And so here I am on the ground next to an unpainted barn that, uh, that I was trying to paint you know, in between seasons. And here I, here I see myself lying on my back, looking up at the sky, looking at this unpainted unfinished projects that I had committed to do and my world was taken out from underneath me. And so, so this story is really intense, right? But I would like to talk to you about that moment that happened afterwards. So of course, initially you were devastated, right? You felt <clears> like <throat> your world has ended. Which of course, anybody would feel the same. You know, people say, be positive, be positive, but it doesn't come like this, right? It doesn't yeah. come instantaneously. Sometimes need some time to really grieve and to really feel all of the emotions. But you shared with me that story in LA um, about what happened in the canteen when you realized that you had more than so many other people. Can you share that story, please? Because that's a, that's a great story. Um, yeah, the, the question that changed my life, it kind of took me out of this sauna of self-pity as I described it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I don't so, want to so, give it away, but yeah, that's the one. Yeah, absolutely. So there was a question that changed my life forever because people always ask me, are you always this positive? And are you always this happy? And the, and the, and the answer is no, I wasn't always this positive. I wasn't always this happy. In fact, my wife uh, sometimes thinks I'm too happy and too positive. Like, Jeff, will you bring it down a little bit? And I'm like, uh, hun, will you bring it up a little bit? And that doesn't end very well. And, and, uh, but I had an experience that changed my life. And what was interesting, I had an experience that I think prepared me for this moment. I want people to understand that some of these things I'm going to share with you took a lifetime to, to learn, took a lifetime to master, took a lifetime to get where I am right now. So often people look at people's success and like, wow, man, if I could just get there right now. But they don't realize that overnight success takes 10 years to accomplish more times than not. And, uh, and so, you know, understand there's a lot of stuff that happens before, before this experience. And I'd love to share some of those things as well. But I, I want you to imagine, right? Here's a young man, prime of his life working his whole life to get to the point where, Hey, you know what? I tasted the sweetness of success. I tasted two downs. I got to experience what it'd be like to be on the first team and as leaders, right? we we understand that as leaders, there's more to it than just getting people to the stadium and into the stands, you know, as leaders and successful leaders, we're trying to get people out of the stand stands and down to the sidelines and not just on the sidelines, but to wear a Jersey that they're proud to don. And not just to wear a jersey that they're proud to don, but to actually get them into the, into the, the playing field of life. Mm. And, and what, once you start to get into the game and you get to experience life, I'm telling you, you get to see things in color. You get to hear things that you never heard before. You get to smell things and taste things and experience things that you've never experienced before. And so, um, so what, I, I want you to just imagine, right, having – Worked your whole life up until that point. You taste the two downs and all of a sudden, instantly. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
uh-huh. it's taken. And I'm on the ground. I had fallen 40 feet. My dreams of playing football, done instantly. Mm-hmm. My dream of riding a motor- motorcycle, buying a bullet bike. I wanted to get a bullet bike, Jimmy, because every time I saw a guy on back, there was a gir- every time I saw a guy on a bullet bike, there was a girl on back. Yeah. And I'm like, I thought in small print that it said girls included. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so in the in back of my mind, I'm thinking, ah, the chicks dig the wheels. And it wasn't until I got in a wheelchair that I realized that the chicks dig the wheels. <laughs> That's awesome, man. What a reframe. What a reframe. Yeah, absolutely. Of way, of what you said one time, you said that a wheelchair gave you a microphone in a way to spread your message because people notice you. People, when you ride into a room, when you roll in, people literally notice you. And you can, it's your decision whether you're going to use it or not. And you chose to use it, right? To spread yeah. your message, to help other people. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, thank you for, for, uh, for noting that. And, and, uh, I received that compliment because at, at first I, I really did not like my wheelchair at all. In fact, I remember the first day rolling into the weight room after my accident. Here I am, I'm rolling into the weight room cause I needed to, I needed to work out again, at least in my mind. And so I go rolling in there and you know how loud weight rooms are. Hmm. The weights are clinking the music's blaring and people are grunting. And I come rolling in there and it seemed like the place just stopped. It, like the music turned down all by itself and people just stopped lifting. And they did, they literally stopped lifting and they started and they just stared at me. And I wanted to roll out of there as fast as I possibly could because I'm like, ugh, no, this wheelchair, man, this wheelchair is the, you know, bane of my existence. I'm like, do not like it at all. And, and I just kept on going though. I'm like, no, I got to keep doing this. And so I went and sat down on the bench where I put, you know, 245 plates on the bench and rolled and transferred onto the bench and laid down and lifted up the weights and just started lifting again. And I was like, oh, okay, this guy's, this guy's normal. And, um, that word normal, you know, everyone's like, you know, they, they talk about, they want to feel normal. Mm. And really what I think they're trying to say is they want to feel comfortable because who really wants to be normal, right? Um, we, we want to be extraordinary. And I always see myself as an under, an under ordinary guy doing ordinary things, extraordinary, meaning just, just a little bit more, a little bit more consistent, just doing the little things that make the biggest difference. And whenever we try to do something new or we're experienced with something new, there's always pushback. There's always discomfort. And, uh, and these are some things that I've discovered as I'm lying here on my back and I have to sift through these broken pieces and, and, you know, this shattered back and broken pieces of my dreams. And, and, and so I had to sift through it. But as you mentioned, and as you talked about, and you can imagine when I received the news from the doctor, by the way, you, you mentioned my book. Do you mind if I just w- read one page from it? It might 100%. give you some insights. I'm going to put the cover in the video as well. So people know, but yeah, please go ahead. And then afterwards, you have to tell me the story of the canteen because people are going to love it. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting to that. I promise you. I'm kind of, I'm kind of like, you know, dangling that carrot out there. The, 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 uh, the question that changed my life forever, and I believe it can change yours as well. But I want you to imagine, right? So here I am. I finally get to the hospital, and I'm, I'm not quite sure if I'm paralyzed. I couldn't move. I couldn't do certain things. Like, you know, I could... I could grab my legs, but my, you know, my legs, I get my hands to fill my legs, but my legs couldn't fill my hands. And so I'm like, Ugh, maybe we'll come back. Cause I've had some stingers before where you tackle somebody and your arm goes numb. And then, mm. and then a few seconds later, minutes later, it comes back. Well, I went to the doctor, I got to the hospital. They took a picture of my back and the doctor came back and gave me the news. And I just want you to just, you know, I want you to think about that question I asked earlier. How do you deal with major difficulties and difficult setbacks. What's your MO? Because we always wanna go back to what's comfortable. We always wanna go back to what's normal or natural. And I love love the the analogy of fruit because when the pressure increases, whatever comes out is what we've put put in. So for example, if if I apply pressure to an apple, what's going to come out? Well, the juice. Juice, juice is gonna come out. And what kind of juice is gonna come out? If I, if I apply pressure to an apple, apple juice is gonna come out, right? If I apply pressure to a pineapple, what's coming out? Pineapple juice, and same thing with an orange, orange juice. 
And, and so what's interesting is as soon as life applies pressure to us, what comes out? Mm-hmm. Whatever we put in. And, 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 I, and I would say, you know, whatever comes out is, you know, is, is our nature. But really what's interesting is we program our nature more than we think we do. Yeah. And, and so I'm always hesitant to say that, uh, you know, whatever comes out is, you know, is, is, our, is our nature. But really what, what comes out is what we put in. So when the, when the pressure is applied, what comes out is what we put in. And so we've got to prepare, you know, for these pressure type situations. I know none of us predicted what's happening right now. None of us predict what's going to happen in the future. But if we're doing certain things and putting certain things inside of us that will prepare us for difficult situations, we can be prepared. And I'm convinced with this 100%. So now I hear, so, but here's the thing. I've, I've had a, a lifetime up until 40 plus years to, you know, figure this out and to practice it and to master it. But when I was 21 years old, I was just starting to figure it out. And um, I want you to just imagine what is your go-to? What is your, what is your natural response when, when you're de- dealt with a difficult challenge or um, a major setback? And so I want you to think about that as, as, as you put my, yourself in my shoes, as the doctor comes back with the news. After he took a picture of my back, um, he said this. The look on his face said it all. Jeff, he began, your L1 vertebrae has been shattered. He continued as a professional should. It exploded from the force of the fall, damaging your spinal cord without letting any of us respond. He continued with the diagnosis. Your T12 vertebrae is compressed as well. The silence in the room was palpable. The hum of the air vent was drowning out the noise in my head. You could almost hear everybody's heart beating out of their chest. Each word from the doctor was like a blow from the heavyweight boxer. The knockout punch came next. You're paralyzed from the waist down. The room began to circle and I almost didn't hear what came next. You're neither, you'll neither walk nor move your legs again. We've scheduled a time for your surgery to repair your spine the best we can. The lights were going out and the doctor was almost finished. Do you have any questions you would like me to answer? We sat there in silence, not knowing what else to say or do. If you need anything, the doctor continued sympathetically. Let me know. I'll do the best I can to help you. We said nothing. It felt like the wind had been knocked out of us. The silence was deafening as he looked at us with our mouths half open. With nothing more to say, the doctor turned and left as fast as he entered. The news was direct and clear. Your back is broken, you are paralyzed from the waist down, and you'll never use or move your legs again. Those statements were crystal clear and to the point. I couldn't misinterpret those comments. It was obvious at that moment my dream of playing football at BYU was, odd, was over. That's heavy, man. That's really heavy. So everything that I had wrapped my identity, identity around, the labels I've been giving myself, the things that I was preparing for. I'm a football player. I'm going to play. I'm a college football player was stripped and taken away instantly, leaving me basically naked in the sense that what I had identified myself as before was instantly taken away. And now what? Now I had to look around and say, okay, I have to make a decision here. Who am I? What do I want to do? And where do I want to go? And so, uh, you know, I had some, I had some, some dark days after that, you know, I, um, um, I had a decision to make. I could stay down and wallow in that syrupy, sticky sauna of self pity that, that had entered, or I could pick the pieces up and dream new dreams. 20 years later, looking back, hindsight's 2020. It's easy to say, yeah, dream new dreams, you know, pick yourself up, think positive thoughts put good stuff inside you. And, um, and so as you mentioned, um, I entered into this sauna of self pity and, and that's, it's one of the chapters, one of the mile markers I call them because I believe our life is a journey. It's kind of like climbing Mount Everest. they are mile markers along this journey that instead of trying to conquer the whole mountain at first and at once to take it just a step at a time, to take it at a, a mile marker at a time. And one of the mile markers in my life was, um, was exiting the sauna of self-pity. And I think we all need to 
exit that sauna. And what you said, Jimmy, is just resonates with me so much. And that is we can focus on what we can't do or we can focus on what we can do. And when I'm in that sauna and when everyone else is in that sauna, where are, where's our focus? On what we can't do. And at that I, time you were, you were still focusing, you, you were probably going through your mind trying to imagine what could have happened if, right? What if, what yeah. if, what if, and that was yeah. killing you, right? It was destroying me because, you know, I was, I was learning how to, to move quick, to run fast. And now it took me a half an hour to put my pants on. Because mm -hmm. I'm having to grab my legs and put on this, and, and I have changed everything. It took me it took me 45 minutes to get out of my bed into my wheelchair with the hate, with the aid of two nurses. So you had a moment. So you had a moment when you felt that life will never be positive. You had that moment, right? Absolutely. In fact, it was dark. It was dank. It was like, in fact, I was angry. You know, after my surgery, after my surgery. Um, the, the hospital stopped feeding me in bed. They kept feeding me, but I had to get out of bed and go to the cafeteria to do that. And so, you know, every morning I had to wake up. I'm like, oh, it's going to take me a lifetime to get out of bed and to get dressed. And then, you know, an hour and a half, which used to just take me, boom, wake up, go to the bathroom and, and, and chow and eat something. And so I'm getting, I'm rolling down these sterile halls of the hospital, shaking my fist at God you know, complaining and, and, and crying about why me? Why me? You know, why were my legs taken away from me? Why did I, do I have to go through this, you know, um, situation? And there's some other things that I describe in my book that, uh, you know, are very, very personal for a 21-year-old guy that, uh, you know, being paralyzed from the waist down, everything down below your waist does not function. And so here I am having this, this experience where I'm like, man, life is horrible. And I was focusing on the things that I couldn't do. And I'm rolling down the halls of the hospital. I go to the cafeteria. I get my food. And I want to be alone. I don't know if you've experienced this before, Jimmy, where when you feel hurt, where you feel pain, where you feel disrespected, where um, things are just completely turned upside down, you want to get away from it as far as you possibly can. I just wanted to be away from everybody and anybody. And so I grabbed my food. I, I took my tray and I went to the corner of the cafeteria and I placed the tray down on the, on the table and I'm flavoring my food with my tears and I'm just wallowing. I'm, I'm having a, the best pity party anyone can ever have. And I want to be left alone. And I'm, and I'm flavoring the food with my tears and also on this tray plops down in front of me. And I'm about to look up to this guy and tell him to, to go away and to get out of there with words that I'm not going to use right now to describe that. But I was upset and I looked at him and he looked at me and I was about to tell him to go take a hike when he asked me a question that changed my life forever. And he looks at me and I look at him and he asks, why are you crying, dude? I'm like, what? He's like, why are you crying, dude? And in his slurred speech, I understood what he was asking me. He, 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 he said, why are you crying, dude? That question mm. snapped me out of my pity party. And I looked around and I realized for the first time that there are other people that had it worse off than me. I realized there's here's this guy who was paralyzed from the neck down. He had a halo on his head, screwed into his skull. He couldn't even move his arms or his head or his body or his fingers. And he had somebody feeding him like he was a baby again. And the guy right next to him was paralyzed from the neck down as well. But he had some movement to where he could lift his arm, but he couldn't close his hands. So they taped a fork to his fingers. And they, they, they were having him learn how to feed himself. By the time he got his fork to his mouth, the food had fallen off. And here I am looking around, having the biggest pity party of my life when I realized, you know what? What can I do? I can move my hands. I can move my arms. I can give hugs, which I love, by the way. I'm telling you, man, it is so great. And I, and I can transfer. I can lift and I can use my hands where other people can't. Unbelievable, man. And, you know, what I love about the story and how deep you went into it. I, I, by the way, I appreciate how deep you went, actually, because you explained the exact emotions you felt. 
I feel like this is powerful for anybody watching this because especially now we are in this crisis where people are overwhelmed by fear. And it's easy to look at your own situation, whether you got sick, maybe family members got sick, perhaps you lost your job or business is going down or you worry about economy, whatever it is. And it's easy to get into this um, mindset of life will never be better. But that's why I asked you before, I said, hey, so at some point you felt like you will never have positivity in your life, right? And you said, yes, I felt like this. I felt in this pit of despair. And you managed to build the life of your dreams, which is incredible. So um, this only shows that it doesn't matter how low you go and how much, uh, you know, how, how life kicks you in the face, you can always get back up. It's, it's all up to you, right? You make that decision. So I love this because I feel like, you know, there are many people who talk about the power of positive thinking mm -hmm. and it's great. I think we need more of this in, in today's world. But when people hear stories like yours, it really triggers something. It makes you like, I, I, look, you shared a story with me already, right? I know your story. Um, still listening to you right now, reading that chapter, I feel goosebumps because I'm imagining myself in that situation. I don't yeah. have the type of character. I travel all the time. I do crazy things, very active. And I imagine myself with my family and what would happen in my own mind. And as much as I love to reframe, it's a pretty tough thing to reframe. Yes. So it's, it's extremely powerful, man. Thank you for sharing this. Really. Absolutely. And Jimmy, Jimmy, can I, can I add something to one, one, one of the, uh, the details that really is incredible is that person that was sitting across the table from me that set me free from my prison was a prisoner at the point of the mountain there in, in, in the city of Utah. So he was an inmate, a prisoner, somebody who was deemed as a citizen that does not belong in society. He was lifting weights and he had an aneurysm in his brain and so he was paralyzed from the right side and so that's why he was there to receive some therapy. So here's this prisoner who set me free from my prison by a simple little question. Why are you crying, dude? And so, so I pass that on to, to you and your listeners. Why are you crying, dude, right? Why are we looking at the things that we can't control and why don't we start focusing on the things that we can control? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that, uh, you know, I've built a, a, um, a life that I've dreamt. And, and what was interesting is after I had that experience, I had a new dream. And that dream was I'm going to walk again. Not just walk again. I'm going to run again. I'm going to walk and not be weary. I'm going to run and not faint. I'm going to have a full recovery. And, and again, it's been 20 plus years. I'm not running and I'm not but walking but completely. You climb the mountain. <laughs> but you climb a mountain, right? But I am getting there. And here's what you mentioned that you just have to take it step by step, no matter how big a step that is. And, and, and I learned that we can focus on what we can do or we can focus on what we can't do. And so my dream was to, to walk again. I told the doctor, I'm going to walk, doc. And the doctor just laughed at me. He's like, Griff, it's impossible. You can't walk. And there's all the evidence stacked up against me. I had an incision from my belly button to my backbone. I, you know, they opened me up. It was an eight hour surgery. They, de they detached my diaphragm, deflated my lung, cut one of my ribs off, cleaned up the shrapnel that was inside there, put a four inch metal plate, two screws on top, two screws on the bottom. They, you know, it's reattached the diaphragm, inflated my lungs, sewed me up and sta stapled me shut. And so there was evidence. I couldn't even move. I couldn't even feel. And so there was evidence to stack up against me. Here's this expert over here telling me, you can't walk again. It's impossible. And how many times have we been told that we can't do something? Because it's impossible. You're delusional, Jimmy, to think that. You're delusional, Jeremy or Garrett or Bethany or Brittany or whoever it might be, right? What I've learned is we as individuals, we base other people's possibilities on our limitations. We base other people's possibilities on our limitations. And so we're always telling everyone else what they can't do based on the things that we believe we can't do. And as human beings, we reject what we don't understand and we base our possibilities on what we know. And so there's the paradox. When they, because if we ever want to do something we've never done before, we gotta go above and beyond the place 
that we know. We've got to go into that darkness. And so we've got to, we've got to focus on what we can do instead of what we can't do. The word can't is so debilitating. It's so limiting. It's so poisonous and paralyzing. And, and we, we use that word 150,000 times by the, by the time we're 17 years old compared to uh, I can 5,000 times. So you talked about reframing. So we've got to continue to put in the good so that it can pollute the bad. As Zig Ziglar says, you got to get rid of that stinking thinking. And, uh, and, and so there's certain things that you've got to do to actually get rid of that stinking thinking because people are like, Hey, be happy. Hey, lose weight. Hey, pick yourself up. Hey, go get another job. Hey, dream new dreams. But how do I do that? What's the process? Exactly. I was about to ask you. So when that situation happened, right? Why are you crying? Do you, you reframe, you have this aha moment. Oh wow. People have worse than, than me. I can still do something in my life. Since then you literally have built a tremendous life, a life that so many people would want to live. I mean, playing basketball, right? You, you went to Paralympics. Yeah. So, so, so you did some, you have a family, you, you, you travel around the world, dude. I mean, you live in an incredible life. So I'm, yeah. I'm curious to hear, cause anybody listening to this, they may think, okay, cool. I get it. You had a, you had the aha moment, but you didn't stay fully positive. All the steps along the way, there are moments when, you know, midnight, Maybe you had a bad day and self-doubt kicks in and slaps oh, yeah. in your face. What, what is the process? Tell me, what is, what is the process? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What is the process? So yeah. here's, what I, here's what I want to, uh, to uh, just put out there. Disclaimer here. Do I have bad days? Absolutely. Do I get down? Absolutely. Do I have ups and do I have lows? Do I have highs and do I have lows? Absolutely. But have I been in that sauna, that, that syrupy, sticky sauna of self-pity since? And the answer is no, I have not. In fact, when people meet my wife, they're like, is he always like this? Yeah, too much. Um, I have some bad days. I have some bad moments. But what's interesting is, is I've learned that, as I mentioned, you can focus on what you can do or you can focus on what you can't do. And so just to kind of give you an idea here, and so what I've done here is I've come up with a process that helps you develop a P squared mindset. That's what I call it. The P squared mindset mm -hmm. and P squared is, is the possibility principle. So you got two P's P squared is the possibility principle. And I believe it is the, the foundation of every challenge and, and it's the, it's the foundation of every solution, how we can turn the impossible into the possible is to develop this P squared mindset, this P squared mindset. And you ask, well, how do you do that? Right? How do you develop this P squared mindset? And, um, before I share that with you, I just want to share you a few things that I've learned that comes with the P squared mindset. And I look at you, Jimmy, and you have the P squared mindset. You look at other people and you're like, you, they've got it. They've got it. And you, and you go up to, and some of the people, they've got it, but then you ask, the, you ask them, how did you get it? And they're like, get what? I'm like, how do you turn everything into gold that you touch? <laughs> how do you succeed at everything that you do? How do you draw people to you? And um, I call those unconscious competence. They don't know how they're doing it. They just do it because they're doing the things that help them. This P squared mindset will help you develop a desire and a dream that matches with each other. I don't know if you've ever had conflicting desires before, Jimmy. Oh yeah. Where you're like, you know what? I want to be the greatest person in the world. I want to be the most sought after speaker in the world. And you're an amazing speaker. I'm telling you, uh, I, I've seen you on stage and there's other people who are like, I want to get good grades, but they party and play on the weekends and they sleep in all day. Right. They have this conflicting desire. In fact, I had a buddy one time. He's like, Hey Griff, I want to lose some weight. I have a desire to lose weight. In fact, if I hung out with you long enough, I think I could lose some weight. I'm like, let's do it. He's like, no, really, I want to lose weight. I have a desire to lose weight. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. Now in between sentences, he would take a drink from his big bowl. <laughs> and he says, I want to lose weight. Help me lose weight. And then he'd take a bite from his Twinkie. Mm, man, help me lose weight. And so I always ask the question, does my buddy have a desire to lose weight? And there's a lot of people that will instantaneously, you know, shake their head and say, no, he doesn't have a desire. And there's others who are like, yes, he does have a desire to lose weight. 
And I believe he has a desire to lose weight, but what does he have a greater desire to do? Mm -hmm. He has a greater desire to eat Twinkies and drink Big Gulps. These things that are counterproductive to his other desire. And so we've got these conflicting desires that we're always having to deal with. Um, in the grocery store business, they call it shrink. Their margins are just, are just razor thin. And so if they're dealing with shrink, which is products that are being ruined, products that are being stolen, products that aren't being sold fast enough, they have to get off the shelf, they lose things. And so there's some things that we just have to get rid of. And I've talked about how you have to put in good stuff so it will, so it will dilute the pollution. But we also got to get rid of the bad stuff the weeds run. and stop putting the bad stuff in, in, inside us. And so we've got to learn how to develop a desire that is burning and desperate and, and deliberate. And we can do that. We know how to do that. And we have to not only develop that desire, but we have to couple it with a dream that is crystal clear. Because if you know what you want, that dream starts to pull you. Mm -hmm. It starts to dra not just drag you, but pull you. And it's just like, I got to go. I just got to go. I got to go. And instead of being dragged, instead of being kicked, you're like, you know what? I'm just drawn to this. Oh, uh -huh. Oh, yeah. And most people don't know what they want. And the majority of us know what we don't want. So there's the problem too, is we don't know what we want. And here's the beauty. We know how to help you figure out what you want. I call it dream weaving. 10 minutes will change your life. Mm -hmm. And so developing that desire and establishing a dream that's crystal clear. And when you couple it with emotion, and, it, and, I, and, I, and I like to say emotion because there's some negative emotion that helps drive us. And there's, there's emotion that we, we perceive as being negative, but we turn out that later on in our life, we turn them back and we turn around like, you know what? This wasn't negative at all. This was a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. like and so we want to take those. Right. What's that? Proving the doctor wrong. Yeah. Example, huh? Right. You're like, you know what? <laughs> you tell me that I can't, I'll show you that I can. And, and so you've got to develop this desire and this dream that match and couple it with emotion so you can begin to experience these unimaginable possibilities to create. That's just the one thing. There's five benefits that come with a P-squared mindset. And the way you develop this P-squared mindset is you do the daily dime. I call it the daily dime. You know, Zig Ziglar says you got to get rid of the stinking thinking. I was with a buddy of mine down south of uh, Utah. It's a desert. And they have a reservoir that feeds the top – three cities in the state, the population. And this reservoir, people play on it. You know, they, they boat, they fish, they recreate. And the question was, well, what happens if the reservoir becomes polluted? Do you have to drain the reservoir and then do the other things? Well, we know there's filtration in, in, involved there, but his response just struck me. And it was, Griff, the solution to pollution is dilution. <laughs> The solution to pollution is dilution. You've got to put more good than bad. And if that's, if, if that's what you're doing, if you're focusing on what you can do and you're focusing on the good more than you are on what you can't and, what the, and the bad, you're progressing. Mm -hmm. so what, are some of, what are some of the practical things people could do right now in this crisis? Because uh, I'm trying to put myself in the head of a viewer. And I know that many people, many of my students write to me, they tell me, look, yeah, I'm watching your videos and I try to stay positive, but I'm here with five kids running around in this little mm -hmm. flat and we have our parents in here as well. Yeah. Can't go anywhere and, and the business is going down and I know I should be positive, but what do I do? How do I do that? Yeah. What, like you wake up in the morning and, and negative thoughts come to you, right? We are just humans. How yeah. do you manage that? So I, I mentioned the daily dime. The daily dime is what helps you with the, the P squared mindset. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, I was, I was reading a book. I don't know if you've ever uh, read the book from Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. He talks about self-suggestion, auto-suggestion. He talks about, uh, you, know, you know, talking to yourself 10 minutes a day. And I'm like... <laughs> I can't stand listening to myself. How can I, how can I put positive thoughts into my own mind? I'm like, dude, you're an idiot. You're, you're so ugly. You know, you look at your flaws and whatnot. 
And uh, you know, we could we could joke about how you know how girls you know look in the mirror and they and they're like beautiful, they're gorgeous. There might there there might only be one flaw, and they just focus on that one flaw. Mm. And a guy might just be like hideous and and out of shape, and he might just have one good thing, and he focuses on that one good thing. And he's like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> and lingers a little bit longer in front of that mirror. But what's interesting here is how do you spend 10 minutes talking to yourself, self-talk, positive talk, because we talk to ourselves. And, it, and, it's, and if you're the person that says, well, I don't talk to myself, you're talking to yourself right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so 10 minutes, I'm like, I can't do 10 minutes. So I came up with a, with a process and a procedure and some tools to kind of help me stay focused because my thoughts take off quick, right? And I've learned, Jimmy, that my day begins when I go to bed. Hmm. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. My day begins when I go to bed the night before. And um, hmm. I don't know if you can see, I'm just going to grab this right here. Dude, that's okay. actually, that's really powerful. Huh. Got me thinking now. So, so there's so many people are like, they wake up, right? And they wake up, they might wake up tired. They might, wake, they might wake up exhausted. They might be waking up thinking, oh crap, I've got these hoodlums. I have five kids running around like five. I've got this same day planned for me. And, and, and we're like, I don't want to wake up. No way. I, I call it never, never, you know, going to Neverland, you know, Peter Pan, where these boys go to Neverland. And there were moments where I had to go and just take a nap and get away from my reality because it was just so ugly and it was so nasty. And I'm like, this is too much that I can handle. At least I thought I could handle because I didn't, I didn't have this process in place. I call them holy habits and righteous routines, Jimmy. So there's things that I do consistently on a daily basis that, that I won't let anything get in the way. They're so holy and it's so righteous that the, I call them holy habits and righteous routines. And so my day begins before I go to bed. And so I, 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 this, this tool right here, it looks like a book, but it's, it's more of a tool. And what it does, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you can see that. I can oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Actually, the cover again. Yeah, so it's, it's, right. it's called Endless Possibilities. And people can find this on Amazon, on your website? On uh, my website, on Amazon. Amazon shut me down. I don't know what's going on. Maybe somebody out there listening can help me get back up. But they're, really? they're not letting me on there. And so, but uh, this book's available on my, my website. But this book right here is I put it together because of all the, the practice and the years that I've done helping thousands of the harshest critics called teenagers and young adults. I've been working for the, with them for 16 years, but I've learned that adults are just teenagers who haven't figured it out. Oh yeah. <laughs> and here's, and, and here's, here's, I'm giving you the, the secret here. And that is to spend five minutes at night and five minutes in the morning. So you're spending 10 minutes a day, but you're, 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 you're breaking it up. And I've learned at the beginning, five minutes was just so long. And I'm like, oh, five minutes, I can't do this. It's just, but I realized that I, I, I need more like 15. And now I'm up to 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes at night because I love this time with myself. Because now what I get to do here is I get to create a life by design instead of by default. And if I'm just waking up in the morning, I am just living life by default. I'm living out life off of habits that have been developed unconsciously and consciously throughout my life. And so if I'm not taking charge of that, mm -hmm. my life is taking charge of me. So in those five minutes in the evening, five minutes in the morning, you visualize and you do affirmations. Do you write things down? Yeah, in fact, you know, I, I've taken, you know, the liberty to, you know, people call them affirmations, and, and I love that. I really do. In fact, I was a scout going up, and I didn't know that I was doing that, that self-talk, because, you know, I think it's the motto or the oath that says a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And when we went on scout camps, we had to repeat either the law or the oath or whatever, some of those things before we got breakfast. That was a great motivator. Food is. But I didn't, I didn't realize that that's what I was doing growing up is these, these I am trustworthy. And so what I do here is, you know, I, there, there's a small, small little place down there that says, I can and I will. I can and I will 
I am. That, that phrase right there, I am, is so powerful because when I'm talking to teenagers and kids um, on the first day of class, they come in, I'm like, hey, I want you to, when I call your name, I want you to introduce yourself and tell us who you are. And so I'm like, Johnny. Johnny stands up and is like, oh, my name's Johnny. I'm a football player. Jennifer. I'm Jennifer. I am a cheerleader. Somebody, somebody else gets up. And, they, and what's interesting is we so often just tell people who we are based on what we do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's not the case. What we do isn't who we are. And so many people are like, oh, you're the guy in the wheelchair. I'm like, I, yeah, I, I am in a wheelchair. You're the wheelchair guy. I'm like, well, no, I get around on a wheelchair, but I am not my wheelchair. And, um, and so those affirmations. And so what I do here is, so five minutes a night, you've got to know exactly what you want or none of this even works. And so that's why the dream weaving is so essential is to 10 minutes to figure out what your dream is and to write it down in really, really clear and concise. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, so I go over exactly what I want. How do I want to be known when I, when I leave this world? And uh, we have some other things that we can do to, to get to that point as well. And so what I do is I go through my day. Um, what, I have a to-do list on this side. It's things that I want to do for this day. And, and at least three things I, w- I would suggest you write down up to five. And of course, you can. there's 10 spaces on there for you to put a to-do list. But I will go through and look at the dream that I want, the kind of life that I want to create. And then what I'll do is I will write down three to five things that I want to do the next day that's going to help me with that. So I already know before I even wake up what I plan on doing. Now, I know that there's, there's, there needs to be some flexibility in there. There needs to be some other places where you just relax and do other things as well. But for me, I at least have direction. Three to five things that I have in mind before I do it. And then what I do is I write down I, on the next page, it's create a daily gratitude list because oh, gratitude, that is gratitude big. is the fuel to help you keep going. Because if you keep on focusing on what you can't do, it's you're, you're unthankful. You're ungrateful. So if you're, if you're focusing on what you can do, you're focusing on the things that you're grateful for. Yeah. Thank you so much that I was able to do this. Thank you so much that I was able to and what happens here is you start to get into this routine, this flow, where the night before you're writing down three to five things that you want to accomplish. Those three to five things will automatically go on my gratitude list. Mm-hmm. And then I have five, or, uh, five other things. I can easily come up with 10 things. But at the very, very beginning, people are like, oh, I can't think of anything I'm grateful for. Life sucks, man. I, I made these kids, but I can't stand them right now. <laughs> because we're not focusing on what we can do and we're not focusing on what we're grateful for. And, uh, and, and Jimmy, I always tell people, I am grateful to be in a wheelchair. I really am. I'm dissatisfied, but I'm grateful. One of these days I'm going to get out of this chair and I'm going to walk away from it, leave it all behind. But until then, I'm going to enjoy life to the fullest and do what I can do. And, and because of that concept, I believe I've accomplished more from a wheelchair than most able-bodied men have out of it Mm -hmm. and I wasn't always a happy go I wasn't a happy positive person my whole life I've just learned the possibility principle that if that which we persist in doing becomes easier for us to do 100 percent this is so powerful sometimes you need tragedy like this to make yourself realize that there is more to life right that there is more to life um I never had an accident like this but I, I I had a bunch of situations in my life and I'm curious to ask you about your identity because I think what you're talking about that really has a huge impact on, on your identity. So my identity when I was growing up in Poland after communism was that I'm this poor Polish kid with crooked teeth and uh, I never smiled because I didn't think that I, I looked good enough and I, I didn't speak any languages and I just felt that I'm shy and th- there are no opportunities for me out there. Right? I had yeah. dreams, but I didn't believe they were possible. And then over the years, I started shifting my identity, what you're talking about, right? Just being very focused 
on what you want rather than what you don't want and, and, and just focusing on the positive and who I want to become. I started shifting this identity and nowadays when I have a day when I don't feel like doing something, like today I was doing this um, live call, this conference for a bunch of Russian people, you know, this Russian uh-huh. people. And uh, so, so I walk up and I felt a bit tired. I'm like, ah, you know what? I, I, I'm not in a shape. And the moment I caught myself saying this to myself, I'm like, no, 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 screw that. I, I have to reframe. And I went back to my identity. And I, my identity is that, as crazy as it may sound, I'm a Spartan leader who is here on this planet to change the lives of millions of people. And I'm willing to go through any pain to make it happen. That's it. Huge impact. And the funny thing is, every time I bring myself back to this identity, I, do, I can't do anything. It can be uncomfortable, it can be scary, it can be painful, I'll do anything. So, uh, but it wasn't always like this, right? Back right. in the day, my negative identity would call me back. So I'm curious <laughs> how your identity has been shifting over the years from the moment, you know, you had the accident and you were, you just felt like, you felt in despair. Then you had this aha moment uh, with the prisoner, right? Uh, when he made that comment. And then as you are going through life, how it's been shifting and what is your identity now? Yeah, thank you for, the, for that question. And what's interesting, um, Jimmy, is I love your description. I am a Spartan leader because immediately a Spartan just creates all sorts of images in your mind. And I can, and I can completely see that. Absolutely. I love that. Um, and so here's the beauty of it. I talked about the, you know, the law of the harvest or really, you know, the, this idea with fruit. So many times we as individuals, we want, we desire pineapple and we plant potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> does, that, does that give you a visual? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very visual, so I see it. <laughs> I want pineapples and I plant potatoes. And when the potatoes grow and it, we're like, wow. This was quick. This was amazing. We pull them out. We look at them like we shake the potatoes like this is not pineapple. Yeah. And then we get upset and we get, you didn't, you didn't sell me pineapple. Well, no, I did. You just planted potatoes. And, and so what we have to understand here is we've got to understand how our identity is established in the first place. If we can understand how the laws of life work, then we can play within the rules. And I believe that the more you understand the laws, the easier it is to receive the rewards. Mm. And when I talk about consequences, what comes to mind, negative or positive? When I say, hey, you're gonna receive the consequences, what do most people think? Negative or positive? How do they? Negative. Yeah, they associate consequences with the negative, right? Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is, aren't there positive consequences? I believe all the time, right? It's so our choices determine the consequences. Mm -hmm. If we exercise, we're going to get the the consequences for exercising. If we're kind to people, we're going to receive the consequences for treating people nice. And so we've got to understand the laws, right? If I plant a carrot, I know. And if I cultivate it and I water it and I weed it, I'm going to have a carrot in 72 days. And so we've got to understand the gestation, how long it takes for cer- certain, certain decisions to come to fruition. You know, we mentioned that, hey, a s- overnight success takes 10 years to accomplish. I've been in the situation 20 plus years to where now, as you mentioned, I can now climb Mount Ben Loma, 9,711 feet. It took me three hours to get up, four hours to get down, but I did it. For you, it might take an hour. 30 minutes up, 30 minutes down because of how good of shape you are and where you are right now. But I know if I keep on going, I'll be able to climb that same mountain much quicker than I did the first time. And so for me, you have to establish your identity. And so often if George, if the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw is accurate, he says that 2% of the population think, 3% of the population think they think, and 95% of the population would rather die than think. <laughs> so don't get me to think here, bro. Don't t- t- you're telling me that I have to think? No, no, thank you. Click, I'm done. I'll just continue to be what other people would want me to be. Because mm-hmm. that's what's happened from zero to eight years old or 
from five, depends on which study you go look at. Our identity, our, our self-image, or better, better yet, other image, has been developed those first five to eight years. And so if we don't like who we are, let's stop pointing the fingers at our parents. Let's stop pointing the fingers at the magazines we're reading. Let's stop pointing fingers at the music that we're listening to. Let's stop pointing fingers at the educational system. Because every time we're pointing fingers at somebody, there's three more pointing back at us. Mm -hmm. And so I've got to take my responsibility. I got to take the accountability. I got to live above the line and I've got to think and decide who I want to be. And that's where it begins. If we can teach people who they are and who they can become, all these other things start to fall into place or start to fall out of place. When those demons of doubt, fear, and complacency start to creep in, you just shine the light on them. You shine the light of your identity on them, and it just dissipates. The darkness goes away, and the light just shines. And the problem is we've forgotten who we are. And so for me, Jimmy, what I do is I remind myself that, that, that every day before I go to bed and, and, and when I wake up, I remind myself who I am. And I am... A, I am a celestial heir. That's my dream and desire is to be a celestial heir of the most high God. I believe that I come from infinite intelligence. I believe I have the DNA of royalty. I believe I come from a creator. And if I come from a creator, then I have the DNA to create. Hmm. And, and so I am royalty, brother. You are royalty. We are all royalty. And so if we can remember who we are, where we came from, and who we can become. I, my dream and desire is to be a celestial of the most high God. I live life to the fullest by developing talents to serve myself, my family, and my friends. We live healthy, wealthy, and spiritually wise lives. We live the laws of life with exactness, which brings forth prosperity and joy. That's my ultimate purpose. That's my ultimate identity, mm -hmm. is to be a celestial heir of the most high God. I believe that all things that, that uh, um, God created all things, sorry, all things were created by God and God wants me to have all things. I'm a dad of four. I want my kids to have everything I have, if not more. And so um, if we can identify who we truly are and who we can truly become, that right there, that light just dissipates and disintegrates mm. those doubts and those demons and that darkness. Because, Jimmy, you are a Spartan leader. Man, I'm telling you. And, and that, that knowledge just helps you go forward when you have – every reason just to stay still. Mm, 100%. And you keep reminding yourself of that, right? You keep yeah. you have to remind yourself. I'm saying this because when I talk to people, many people think, oh, so I'm going to sit down and I'm going to fix my identity for once. And then I'm going to do a bunch of affirmations or temptations. <laughs> do that maybe for a couple of days. That's yeah. it. I yeah, that's it, man. <laughs> I remember. I don't remember who said that first. Was it Jim Brown? Maybe someone. Maybe Zig Ziglar said something like, "Hey, um, personal development is like shower. Like you got to take it daily, otherwise you're gonna stink." Yeah. And like nobody says, "Oh, you took a shower last week, so why would you do it again?" <laughs> right? No, no, you do it yeah. every day. And yeah. it never ceases to amaze me how little time people spend just working on their own minds, right? You can spend one or two, but sometimes been five hours watching television every day, but you wouldn't spend five minutes working on this here that controls everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really powerful what you're talking about. I, I, I can really resonate. Dude, it's such a great conversation, man. Really enjoy talking to you. It's always, it's yeah. always awesome. So I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. Can I, can, I, can I share one thing with you? Of course. For your, for, your, for your listeners and whatnot. Do me a favor, Jimmy, and everyone else who's listening or, and, and, and watching, just take your hands like that. Interlock your fingers to where it's comfortable. Okay? So look down. Um, is your, raise your hand if your left thumb is on top of your right hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is that you? Yeah. Okay, so you're normal because that's what I do. And it has nothing to do with normalcy. 
But there's some people out there uh -huh. that have it opposite, where they have their right thumb on top of their left hand. And so what I want you to do here, and you probably did it, is I don't want you yeah. to just change the thumb. I want you to just change the, yeah. the, 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 the interlocking of the fingers. How'd that feel? Feels strange. Yeah. It feels strange. I've heard ooh, I've heard yuck, weird, right? And so what we have here, try going back and forth really quick. But it feels curious. That's, that's my, okay. I like to be curious about Yes, that. and I love that term curious. And there's some people like they're struggling here. And that's kind of like, you know, our, our psychology, our, our identity. First five to eight years, we've just been told how to hold our hands or we look and observe and we just do it. And we're not even realizing it. Fold your arms, same thing. There's mm -hmm. people yeah. who have their left arm on top of their right arm. And then you try to switch it around and people go in a circle and they can't even switch it back. And they're like, yeah. It feels so weird. It feels weird, yeah. <laughs> In fact, what's interesting here is um, Jim Quick, I, I saw him on a Mind Valley uh, thing and he was talking about oh, yeah, Mind Valley. He's this guy. Uh -huh. He's like, he's this guy. And he's like, hey, go and brush your teeth. It will help your memory with your opposite hand, right? He's like, go yeah. brush your teeth with your opposite hand. Well, try it. Go home and, and try to brush your teeth with your, your non dominant hand and try to go through the whole process. There's pushback. That's what I'm trying to get at is, Everything we do, with Dan Clark says 90% of what we do is habitual. I think that number is too low. I think it's more like in the high 90s. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we try something different, if you have the mindset that you do, you're like, this is curious. This is fantastic. Other people are like, ugh, this is, this is gross. This is uncomfortable. I want to go back to what's comfortable. And so as you mentioned, some, you, you tell people, hey, go do this. Go do this for 21 days. Go do this for 66 days. There's some people who will go do it and they'll try it for two hours, two days, two weeks, and they throw their hands up in there and they're like, you know what? No, this is a bunch of crap. This is not working. And so we have to be consistently consistent. That's part of the P-squared mindset as well is to be consistently consistent in what we do. 100% man. It's all about a habit, right? Anything you've ever learned, you learned how to play basketball. You played in Paralympics. It's, it's crazy. I guess when you got started, it was tough on a wheelchair, right? I mean, it, it takes time to get used to it. Yeah. Just, uh, people tend to, I always tell people, look, if you feel like things are not possible for you, remind yourself of all of the things you've done that felt impossible one day. Even as simple as if you're sitting next to your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, um, just go back to the, to the time where it was just a fantasy, right? Yeah. Or perhaps you have this new job or, or you build this business and then go back to the time where you were sleeping on a couch or on some mattress, eating beans, trying to make ends meet. And, and um, I'm sure for yourself, right, whenever, because we all face challenges, you've done a lot, yeah. but you still face challenges. And I can only imagine the type of power you get whenever there's a new challenge and you go back and you say to yourself, wow, wow, over 20 years ago, paralyzed, weighs down, didn't have a family yet, didn't do all of those things, and look where I am right now. What is really impossible? There, anything is possible. And I know the title of your book is I Am Possible, right? Yeah. And I love that. I love that. It's really cool. You guys got to check it out. And I'm going to link all of those, those things up so people will be able to see, but it's such a great idea with I Am Possible. It's all about reframing. Yeah. And I love how you said reframing because what's interesting is whenever we want to go do something new, we, we change. We change where we're at. And once we change where we're at, whether it's our thinking, whether it's our presence, whether it's somewhere else, there's going to be pushback. Our programming is going to pull us back to what is comfortable, pull us back to what is familiar. And that's why we have to have some things in place to get past the pushback, to get as far away from our past programming that will pull us back to where we used to be, where we once was, because it's very, very powerful. Our programming is so, so powerful. But here's the beauty of it. If we're able to program ourselves at an early age, why can't we reprogram ourselves? And, and so the only way to do that is you've got to come up with a process, right? A process that's going to help you get past the pushback. You know, people, what's interesting, people always say that, you know, habit start, you know, takes 21 days to start. And the study, what's interesting, that study is 21 from 265 days is anywhere where a habit will, will 
take place. Yeah. But everyone mm-hmm. picks the 21 days because it's, it's three weeks. We're done. I can do that. But yeah. it takes 66 days for it to become automatic. So you can start a, you can start a, a routine in 21 days, a habit in 21 days, 66 days to make it automatic. And so why not take another 14 days and go 90 once a quarter? And then you just start again at a different mile marker, a different post, different place. And if you take these small little steps, eventually you'll, you'll turn around and you'll see that you've gone miles. You've gone the distance. You've gone so much further. I love how you said, hey, look back. Take some time to look back and assess where you've come. Take, take some time to look forward and plan and prepare to where you want to go. And then come back to the present and focus on what you can do. Because the past doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is the now the present. It's a gift. Live it. That's why they call it the present. And so be here in the present and focus on what you can do. And so, yeah, you know, learn from the past, prepare for the future. Don't fret about the, don't fret about the past or fuss about the future. Be present, be present right here, right now. And I'm telling you right now, Jimmy, you know, this has been a, a very short hour. It has been for me. I don't know if it is for your listeners, but uh, you know, my son taught me when he was two years old. He's like, dad, there's short hours and long hours. And I'm like, that's pretty profound for a two-year-old. And so I'm like, I want to know what a short hour was for, uh, for a two-year-old. So I'm like, son, what's a long hour? And without hesitation, he's like, church. <laughs> yeah, church can be long. And so I'm like, well, what could be a short hour? And he's like, Pokemon. And I'm like, all right, absolutely. So Jimmy, this has been a short hour for me. And I, and I still have some more time if you do, or if you need to hang up and, and shut this down, we can do that as well. But uh, I, could, I could talk with you all day long. You just have that energy and that, uh, you know, that power that I just love to be around. Likewise, man. I, I honestly think we're going to do more of those. We're going to do more of those talks because it's fun, right? I always, always tell people, look, um, I have some amazing conversations with my friends. And often afterwards, we kind of scratch our heads. Hey, we should have recorded this. We should yeah. have recorded this. Uh, even the conversation we had in LA, I, I, I was wondering, I had, I had actually a bunch of really good conversations in that house. We had some amazing people in there, right? Everyone is just trying to build their own reality. And I was just wondering, wow, if, if we got a movie crew in there, and just, just filming, just paparazzi stuff, just, just filming. <laughs> it would be so much great content, man. So we got to do more yeah. of those. I want to ask you, so I'm actually very, very curious. What is your vision for the future? What is the impact you would like to have on the world? But also vision for yourself. So I'm curious to hear if there is anything that that's still a dream but you're working on making it a reality maybe that big trip or maybe that new business yeah. or charity whatever 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 comes to your mind i'm really curious to hear that yeah so i would say this jimmy that i'm the best unknown speaker you never heard of yet <laughs> um some of the results that i've gotten it, the, the feedback has it, been consistent and um i've been compared to as being impactful as tony robbins Maybe, uh, maybe at the, you know, not the same price. I'm a fraction of the price as, as Tony. Um, but I like to just think that I'm just me, right? And I mentioned that I'm physically paralyzed, but I think most of us are paralyzed from the demons of doubt, fear, and complacency, which keeps us from taking those steps forward to obtain our dreams. And a lot of times we, as human beings, think that it's just not possible. You know, we've convinced ourselves that it's not possible. We're afraid to admit that this is what I want to do, but I don't want my friends to tell me that I'm stupid, that it's impossible to do. You know, my friends, when I told them I want to play football, they're like, you can't play football. You're too short, you're too slow, you're too white. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah, absolutely. But I continue to chase down my dream. I continue, I continue to, to play. I, I was just passionate about it. There's a song in my soul. I played it in the springtime, in the summer, in the, and even in the wintertime. And on Sundays when I couldn't play it outside, I'd go down in the basement and I'd play it in my mind not realizing that I was preparing myself for this mental toughness later on um, that prepared me for the time where I'm like, you know what? I want to walk again. And the doctor's like, it's impossible to walk. And I love the quote from Muhammad Ali that says, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men 
who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Wow. I didn't know that one. That's, that's profound. It's huge. Madame Curie was told that there's no more elements to be found. You're delusional, Madame Curie. <laughs> she continued to listen to the song that sang to her soul, and she discovered two new elements and a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. The Wright brothers are like, it's, it's impossible to control flights. You can fall, you can glide and then fall, but you can't control it. But you and I are able to, to traverse the globe in hours. Indoor plumbing and running water it, it was a distant memory. And there's some countries that still don't have that, that reality. And so what we do today on a regular basis was once deemed impossible in the past. So what are you going to do today to change your presence to improve your future? And it starts right here. It's 100% mental how we prepare, how we practice, how we perform. Everything is 100% mental. Mm -hmm. But how little work is being done between the years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And especially in, in, in today's world with, with the COVID-19 crisis, I hear many people tell me, oh, 2020, we have to scratch it off. It's a shit year. We get rid of it. Don't, yeah. don't forget it. And I, you know... Here's the thing, right? When I came back from LA, I came here. I, I was in Ukraine for a bit. Then I had to come to see my girlfriend in Germany. Otherwise, I would have been locked in Ukraine. And of course, lots of opportunities lost. Uh, we talked about it before, right? Same with you. Lots of speaking gigs lined up that cannot happen now. All types of different things. I'm thinking, okay, I can focus on that. I can focus on how I would have been surfing in Bali and doing that speech and doing that consulting thing over there. But why not focus on some of the new opportunities that came along that I wouldn't have seen if I just kept living my normal life? And for me, a simple thing was, hey, um, finally, I'm sitting in one place. There's no excuse not to write and actually finish the book. And what I did was I made it my obsession. It became a, just a pure obsession. I have yeah. this spider. You can't see I have a whiteboard in front of me. I would put the number of words every single day create mm -hmm. accountability groups. And I would just tell people, look, I'm going to write every single day. There's no way I want. And um, what happened was even when I didn't feel like doing it, well, first of all, going back to my identity, right? I have to do what I have to do to impact millions of people. Okay, cool. But then also reminding myself, wait a second, there is accountability in there. I have to get it done. So I do believe, and that's why I think your message is so powerful. And I really wanted to do this with you because your message tells people that, look, it's ultimately up to you how you will control your life. And you can choose 2020 to be the shittiest year of your life or the best year of your life. Mm -hmm. And I always like to ask the question, I feel like anybody watching this is good if you ask yourself the question, what could I do to make the next few months some of the best months of my life? Whatever happened to you, your family members are sick, I get it. Maybe you are sick, I get it. You lost your job, I get it. So asking yourself this question, even though it may not be that logical, it's not about logic here, it's about shifting your focus because that question will force you to see solutions. And maybe you realize, wait a second, I always wanted to start an online business and I guess now I'm here and the internet is working. Or maybe, hey, I never found the time to read books and now uh, I'm, I'm here and I have more time. Maybe I should start reading every day, even for like 60 to 90 minutes. So I feel like there are always little opportunities here and there that you can use. So uh, how are you holding up yourself in this crisis? Obviously we are on a lockdown. What are some of the things that you are working on now? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, as you mentioned that, you know, what's my dream? My dream was, you know how you, know how you have the, the, the keynote speakers, the headliners, mm -hmm. right? And then it, I don't know if you've ever been to a place where you go to a comedian, you go watch a comedian, they have some, they have some um, warm up, gigs, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. bands and concerts, they have the warm-up gigs. My dream is to be the warm-up and to blow the main headliners out of the water. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. To experience yeah. that, you, you go there, the headliner, the, the warm-up act was better than the headliner. You're like, man, headliner was great. That warm-up act was a fantastic. 
So I want to be that guy to blow out the headliner out of the water, but it's, at the same time, be the headliner someday to where somebody comes and blows me out of the water because that means I'm helping other people out. And as you mentioned too, what's interesting is that is the weekend that I met you down in LA, um, I had just experienced some fraud. I lost $30,000 and, um, it, which, which had just a huge, huge blow to, to my, my speaking business. And then a month later, all my events that were scheduled, as you said, boom, taken away. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people think that, uh, you know, life is just so easy for, for you and I, but we have our moments as well. And I had a decision to make. I'm like, listen, I can focus on what I can do. Or I can focus on what I can't do. My desire is still to, to make this much money and to speak this many times. I've, been, I've had two months worth of work canceled. Big deal. So what? I still have seven more months left of the year mm -hmm. to see what happens. And I'm going to continue to do what I, I'm going to do. And in fact, what was interesting is that same weekend that I met you, I met somebody else that uh, turned into an opportunity to, to be on a um, show, a, um, a Hollywood show that could oh, wow. help expand my reach. It, it got pushed back and it's been postponed to June. And I'm hoping that that happens in June. That same weekend, I also um, met somebody that um, we finalized the deal where I've taken my keynote speech and I've made it into a workshop, right? Four workshops throughout the year. And then we've turned it into an online course. And I don't know if you've heard of Forbes, Forbes Magazine and Steve Forbes. Um, they're starting an online school and they want me to be one of the first 10 contributors. Oh, wow. This, this year. I didn't know that. For, That's amazing. For the, for the Forbes online business, you know, school of business and technology. And, and so I get to be the contributor of the mindset, the mindset guy. I get to be the mindset contributor on Forbes online. And so again, I could have complained about losing and being taken advantage of being, you know, having fraud hit me. And, um, or I could continue to go forward and focus on creating that online course that I wanted to finish and complete. And I completed it that, uh, you know, a week before I showed up to LA, it wasn't, it wasn't a hundred percent done, but because of the things that I was focusing on, it gave me an opportunity to adjust much quicker. When the moment to perform has arrived, the moment for preparation has passed. And so I love that Chinese proverb that says the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. The next yeah. best time to plant a tree is today. Right now. Yeah. Do something. What can you do today that will impact tomorrow? Because if you put off tomorrow, what you can, what you can do today, you'll end up with a bunch of empty yesterdays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You reminded me just now, my friend from Hungary, he has a building business so they, they built all types of houses, uh, amongst other things. And what happened was when Corona hit, they got contracted to build um, a hospital. And normally it, it would be one of those overwhelming tasks, like hospital, that's going to take a long time. And I believe he did it in pff, under two weeks, like built the entire thing. So I talked to him about it. It was really interesting. He's a very clever guy, very young. He's under 30 years old, but he's done a yeah. lot of things traveled with him all over the place. Great dude, great dude. So um, he said, hey man, yeah, I, uh, this crisis taught me that what I thought was impossible is totally doable, right? It's just when you don't think, when you, so here's the thing, right? When you believe that something is impossible, you sabotage yourself. Because mm -hmm. if you believe that you can't do something in say less than two weeks, then you will find a way to postpone. It's this Parkinson's, Parkinson's principle, right? Um, uh, the perceived difficulty of any task increases proportionally to the time allocated for that task. Back, back at the university, you had to write a paper and they tell you you need to submit it in six months. You gotta wait for the first four, but actually for the first five months. <laughs> right. Maybe five and a half. Yeah, and then I have to do it. And then still, you'll probably wait till two days before to sit down and write a damn thing. So I think it applies to life in general. And um, it's not just about always being intense and 
working like crazy, but I think it's about identifying um, smart opportunities and doing things in the right way. You, because you can yeah. be busy for the sake of being busy, but it's about being productive and focusing on the right things. And I think now is the time that's, that's going to test a lot of people. And uh, if you're still watching this video, then just think about it this way. This is the time for you to, to recognize your real strength, to adapt, to pivot. And if you not only survive, but thrive in those times of, of this Corona crisis, nothing can do anything to you in the future. Nothing can, nothing can kill you, right? Imagine how much confidence you're going to get if, if you just keep rolling and, you know, yeah. Brick brick walls are just going down and getting smashed in the face and you just keep going, keep pivoting and making things happen, you become unstoppable. Yeah. And that's exactly what you described, what you've been doing over the last few months. So uh, Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, what's interesting is we as human beings, we want a comfortable life. We we want a life of ease. In fact, 20 years ago, we talked about, and when we teased that there are parents called helicopter parents that are just hovering over their kids, trying to make sure that they get their <laughs> stuff done. You yeah. know what I'm talking about? They've changed the title now to snowplow parents, or depending on where you live, bulldo bulldozer parents, mm. or lawnmower parents is what they're described now. Basically, the concept is, is these parents are starting to push everything, all the opposition, all the challenges away from their kids' existence in their life, and, and they're very unmotivated. They're depressed. The anxiety has increased. Mo emotional distress has, has started to um, pop up everywhere. And, and I've learned that pain, all pain hurts, no matter how big it or little it is. I've learned that all pain hurts. But I've also learned, too, that it's in the challenge that we find the motivation. It's in the struggle we find the strength. And so we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable to push ourselves and to find these challenges and to give ourselves challenges so that we can step up and that we can progress and, and move forward. And like you said, this guy's like, you know, he found direction. He found motivation in this crisis. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what's in, and the irony is, is majority of the challenges out there creates motivation, creates strength. And so if we take away all the challenges in, in our lives, we're taking away the motivation, we're taking away the growth. And, uh, and so I just love this opportunity. This is a great opportunity to just, we all need a hand up. Not a hand out, but we all need a hand up. And so Jimmy, I love just watching you just give people hand ups all the time. I'm excited and looking forward to your book that you just finished in this, in this small window of time where you're like, you know what, what else can I do? This is what I can do. And you've, and you've gone out and done it. And I'm just telling you, man, your shadow casts a, a wide um, area because of the things and how big and great of the things you're doing. I've learned that every great man and woman of history is a man of service. And so go find a way to serve. Go find a way to help others. And by helping others, you've helped yourself. And, uh, and so you're just the epitome of that. And, and, uh, and I love you, man. Love your example, love your life. And, um, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just honored to be able to say that, Hey, I know that guy. I know that guy. Thank you, brother. I likewise, man. Thank you so much. Seriously. It's, it's been a pleasure meeting you. I don't believe things, things happen by coincidence. I like to believe that things happen for a reason. I think me and your meeting in LA wasn't a coincidence. Every time we talk, it's dive deep, tremendous inspiration, lots of aha moments. It's incredible. And what you said before, I, 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 so you said that you are one of the best unknown speakers. And I want to tell you, I want to, I want to say something. It's going to be a bit bold, but, but I do believe that by 2021, a lot of people will know who you are and they'll be following you and they'll be, they'll be tuning in because you have tremendous value to give to the world. Um, your story is incredible. The way you can reframe how positive you are. This is something that cannot be fake. This is something that has to come from within. I know it wasn't easy. And, and for that reason, I feel like when people get exposure to you, they'll realize, wow, this guy knows something that I need to learn. So um, what I hope is going to happen, I'm going to publish this 
this as a podcast. I'm going to uh, p- publish, you know, bits and pieces here and there. But I, I believe you should get on more of those shows. You should get more interviews, more podcasts, because people got to hear you, man. People got to hear you. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Anybody watching this, we already linked up a bunch of things where you can find Jeff. Uh, you can find his, actually, go, just go to his website. I think that's the best place because you will find everything in there, right? Is that the best place to find Yeah, you? absolutely. Yeah. Is it jeffgriffin.com? So it's Griffin Motivation, like G-R-I-F-F-I-N, like the mythical beast. The Griffin is half lion, half eagle. And, and I, like to, you know, I like to say, do it the Griffin way. Uh, the mythical beast way. My wife's like, you're, you're neither mythical nor a beast. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> one day, one day. But uh, yeah, griffinmotivation.com. And um, we've discovered a way. We've discovered a, a duplicatable process that helps even the, uh, the least of the least. They, 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 people just don't give themselves enough credit. And, and we've, we've discovered a process that's duplicatable across gender, across ethnicity. They are t- tried and true. And, um, and I really am so excited just to be able to, if I can just help one person get up out of their chair and take that step forward, you know, people just get overwhelmed with the enormity of the project. And, you know, I apologize for you vegetarians out there, but I always tell people, I'm like, if you're asked to consume a whole cow, because, you know, I've heard, I've heard Confucius say, you know, like, you know, one, you can consume an elephant one bite at a time. I'm like, who eats elephants? But there's people who eat cow that I'm like, you can consume a whole cow one bite at a time. But if you, if you're to go and and consume the whole cow all at once, it's not going to happen. But for some of us, we've consumed two or three cows in our lifetime. And if you don't like the meat eating analogy, you you can't consume the whole garden in one bite. You consume it a bite at a time. A journey a thousand miles begins with one step. So be careful which step you take because you might be going down the path you don't want to end up. And we can course correct and we can change things and we can go where we want to go. It's never too late. It's never too late. And so uh, um, one of these days, Jimmy, you and I are going to be on stage together and we are going to uh, let our light shine um, to the audience and continue to shine for the world, brother. You are a great, great man. You are royalty. And um, you have DNA to create. And you're, you're creating some great stuff. I appreciate it, brother. Hey, thank you so much, man. Thank you once again. And uh, I'm going to speak to you soon. Definitely. Gotta absolutely. Absolutely, my friend. Absolutely. Man, yeah, okay. I love you. Love what follow, you're doing. Follow this guy. Post comments. Any questions for Jeff, let us know. And remember, it's all about what you can control, not what you cannot control. So choose to live this life with passion, even even in the midst of the crisis. All right. Have a great day. Jeff, thank you so much, man. Love you, Jimmy. Thank you. Gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, entrepreneur, adventurer. With my great congratulations, Jimmy, welcome. Give him a round of applause. So let's give a big applause to Jimmy Noreen.